Hey, life science. So we're going to keep doing invertebrates, animals without a backbone. And the next animal without a backbone that we are going to study is phylum platyhelminthes. That refers to flatworms. Last time we did segmented worms. Turns out there's actually a few different kinds of worms. How delightful, Earth. So the uh, flatworm that we're going to actually focus on is the planarian that looks like um, a spill. Honestly, if I had to say what it looked like, it looks like a spill. But uh, let's take a look at its insides. Um, first, though, let's talk about feeding and digestion. So there is lots and lots of information on this. And if this were like a, a ninth grade biology class or something, I think I'd make it a point for you to like write this all down and review it and know it and all that kind of stuff. But um, that's... Uh, I think that's a bit much for seventh grade and, uh, you know, a bit much for our style of learning right now. So really all that I need you to come away with um, here is that we're talking about flatworms and that the particular example of a flatworm that we're looking at is a planarian. And I'm going to give you just a couple bullet points to um, remember about planarians. So let's just talk about how it feeds and digests. So uh, as you see here, it eats small organisms that it grabs with its mouth. Um, it has digestive enzymes secreted into its mouth. Now, um, you actually have digestive enzymes in your mouth. Did you know that? Uh, saliva is a digestive enzyme, or I shouldn't say it's an enzyme. It's a fluid that contains enzymes. It's partially digestive um, and that's maybe not something that occurs to you because you just think of it as, you know, spit or something like that. But it's actually the first stage in the chemical side of your digestive process. So that organism is broken into small particles, broken down by the digestive enzymes. And then a tube-like pharynx extends out of the mouth, sucking up small particles. So it's almost like a combination of cleanup. So imagine that the digestive enzymes are kind of like you know, spraying it with some sort of cleaner, and then it uses a vacuum to, <laughs> to soak it, uh, to suck it up. Okay, so the particles go into the intestines where they are further broken down by enzymes. No stomach, just straight to the intestines. And then this part is uh, worth taking note of. So the intestines reach into all parts of its body, so no circulatory system is necessary. So why doesn't it need a uh, circulatory system if, oops, sure, I spelled that right. Um, why doesn't it need a circulatory system if its intestines reach into all parts of its body? The function of a circulatory system is kind of like, you know, the vascular tissue in plants. It's just to transport materials from one location to another whether it's food from the place where food is produced or harvested to the places that need that food, or whether it's waste from the places that produce the waste out to a system that can get rid of it. That's what a circulatory system does. If the intestines reach into all parts of the body, that means that the nutrition from its food is accessible everywhere. You don't need to transport it. Okay. How about the nervous system? So ner no circulatory system means no heart, but um, it still has something of a brain. So no heart, but still a brain. Maybe you know someone like that. Uh, they have a mass of nerve tissue. If you remember um, in the segmented worms, it had ganglia, which wasn't quite a brain, but a collection of nervous tissue. And that's sort of what we have here too. It's... Um, nerve tissue brain in quotation marks and it's connected to eye spots now these are not eyes they are eye spots what's the difference well an eye spot you can think of as a light sensitive region okay it's a light I don't know if I want to call it a region. That makes it sound like it's part of the country. It's a light sensitive, um, oh, 
I don't want to call it a spot, okay? So light sensitive, um, I'll call it a structure. And the idea is that whenever light, you know, um, shines on this little light sensitive structure, it generates electrical signals in the nervous system. And that's part of how it has a sense of sight. The reason that I'm saying that an eye spot is different from an eye is because an eye usually has more structure to it. An eye has a lens in the front, it has a retina in the back, it's able to actually form an image. A light spot is, I'm sorry, an eye spot is not the same as an eye in that an eye spot doesn't produce an image. In other words, an eye spot is kind of just like, um, almost like a, like a little, uh, solar panel that's able to tell whether it's bright or not, not actually see anything. Okay, well, anyway, um, they do use light to seek out photosynthetic prey. In other words, if you want to eat algae, go, go to where the sunlight is. And it has some longitudinal nerves running down its body connected to each other by transverse nerves, which means they just go across its body. So it has a sense of taste, smell, and touch. So let me write those down. Sense of taste, smell, and touch. By the way, do you know how you would um, determine all the different senses that a uh, um, that an organism has? You take a census. Ha ha ha, moving on. So um, about their reproduction, kind of like an earthworm, they're hermaphroditic, they contain both male and female reproductive organs, but this is so nuts. They're also able to be torn in half and then regenerate themselves. All right, so like, um, that's kind of like sponges, isn't it? Where uh, they can bud or, you know, break off and then regenerate. Um, planarians can do this as well and that's just um that's just a little horrific let's let's move on because i think it's actually time for um oh no we're still in flatworms so uh there are some flatworms that are parasitic remember that uh, parasites benefit at the expense of their host whom they harm and maybe you've heard of these um hopefully you don't have them but maybe you've heard of them so uh parasitic Flatworms include tapeworms and flukes. Um, these are uh, obviously gross. Um, the way that uh, tapeworms work is basically they, uh, they take up residence in a larger animal's digestive tract. Now, if you wanted to go to a place where there is a readily available source of food all the time and also you're protected from outside dangers the digestive tract of a larger animal is a perfect place to be assuming that you can survive being in there because you know it's very acidic after all you've got stomach acid so um if you can just kind of like live in the intestines of say a dog or a human then you're constantly able to just digest the food that that larger animal ate um, with the benefit of never being hunted ever. Okay, let's move on. Because we are done with flatworms, we can move on to roundworms. So everything that you see on the screen here is all that I need you to know about flatworms. Let's go ahead and do roundworms. So roundworms um, is phylum nematoda. So you might call them nematodes. Nematoda roundworms. I didn't even try to write the phylum name for flatworms because platyhelminthes, uh, no, nah, I don't even have room on my, on my paper for that. So roundworms are more similar to Annelida, those are the segmented worms, than to the flatworms, but they're smaller and they're not segmented. So um, they 
resemble the segmented worms more, probably in their shape at least, but they're not segmented. And um, they're found in virtually every environment on Earth. Dirt, Arctic snow, hot springs, hydrothermal vents. So uh, these guys live pretty much everywhere. They live everywhere. Um, I didn't mean that to sound as scary as it came out because that makes it sound like there's one behind you, but um, that's that's not what I meant. Let's uh, <laughs> let's just move on. So their body structure, uh, you could describe it as a tube within a tube. Now I chose this picture because it's kind of see-through and I'm hoping that you can see that there's um, like an external tube that's got the hard uh, defined edge, but then inside it almost looks like there's two worms like superimposed on each other. Now that's the same worm, it's just a tube within a tube. So if we were talking about their body structure as a tube within a tube, let's talk about the two tubes. But that, yeah, that would, say that three times fast. Um, so the outer tube um, has an epidermis and a cuticle. Remember that an epidermis would be the uh, thin layer of cells on the outside of something, and a cuticle is that protective coating just like the segmented worms have, and it's tapered at both ends. The inner tube contains a digestive canal, and it's open at both ends. So if I had to draw something like this, which I do, I'll draw the inner tube as green. <laughs> inner tube sounds like a Sounds like a bicycle tire now. So the inner tube is a, is a digestive canal and it's open at both ends. And then it has an outer tube, which is tapered, which just means it you know gets thinner on both ends. There we go. kind of just looks like a giant like hamburger bun or something but it's a cross section obviously um, so the um, inner tube is where food would pass through okay so yum on one side goes through to get digested and of course it would be yuck on the other side because that would be um, you know that would be its feces um, on the outside, though, that is where it would have its epidermis and its cuticle. That's the only thing cute about it. Get it? Cuticle. Okay, there are also parasitic roundworms. Oh, this is so delightful, all these parasites. So um, the cuticle protects it from its host's digestive digestive juices. Well, that's exactly perfect. Now, did you know that um, your own stomach has to be protected from its digestive juices? I mean, it's a bag full of acid. Seems like the acid would destroy the bag. Actually, no, your stomach um, protects itself with a layer of mucus. Basically, these roundworms are like an inside-out stomach then because they have a protective coating on their outside so that they don't get digested. And that allows them to live in their host's intestines. All right, watch me try to pronounce these Latin names. Anclostoma duodenale. Sure, that has hooks on its mouth to latch onto intestinal wall and feed on the host's blood. Ugh. Well, cook your food, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Necator americanus does essentially the same thing. Um, these kinds of creatures can cause anemia, which means that your uh, blood doesn't have enough um, oxygen or iron in it. Um, it's, it's basically a blood deficiency, and this can be caused when your blood is consumed. Um, abdominal pain, obviously, if you have a parasite in um, your intestines, it's probably going to hurt. Also, diarrhea and weight loss. It's interfering with your digestion. So you can think of it like it's interfering in your body's ability to make use of food. Whew. This is um this is a happy section. Oh, it just got even happier. So here's another one, Trichinella spiralis. So this is actually one 
that um, is more of a daily life kind of thing because of the source. So Trichinella spiralis lives in the intestines of pigs and other game animals. And so when the female reproduces, this is the um, the female Trichinella spiralis, um, the young of this roundworm enter the host's blood vessels and muscle tissue. It actually will enter into um, its muscles and they develop for two weeks and, uh, and they form cysts. Um, so you uh, you can see a picture there. It looks like little coiled up stuff inside of muscle. So this is a, um, a, a worm infestate, uh, shoo, a parasitic worm that something like a pig might have. Okay, so how does this affect us? Why is this a daily concern for us. It's because of trichinosis, which is the name of the disease of being infected with um, uh, this roundworm. So if these roundworm young that are living in muscle tissue, well, that's that's where meat would come from. So if it's, say, living in, um, in a pig, right, then this could be um, infecting some pork or some ham or something. So when infested meat is consumed, then the digestive juices free the young from the cysts, right? So the young are kind of kept safe in these little cysts. You eat some infested pork, the uh, stomach releases the young from those cysts. They can develop into adulthood in two days, and then they're in your intestines. So first they would cause intestinal and abdominal symptoms, and then after reproduction they'll enter your muscles. So, whew, back when we were doing bacteria, we talked about E. coli and how they tend to um, inhabit um, certain food sources. Um, and then we talked about salmonella, which is more common in poultry. Uh, trichinosis is the most likely form of food poisoning from uh, pork products. This is why different kinds of meat have their own preparation instructions, like what temperature they should reach, how long you should cook them. Uh, obviously, the muscle tissue between birds and pigs is different, so that there's that too. But um, whenever you've got cooking instructions, the point is how to make sure that anything living in it is dead. Anything that um, you don't want to start living in you Ah, oh, man, it was a lot more fun when we were studying flowers. Let's keep going. Oh, here's something a little nicer. Phylum mollusca, the mollusks. So mollusks are also invertebrates, and they are part of this group of squishy invertebrates. So let's go ahead and do some mollusks. I think now might be a good time to get a fresh piece of paper because we got a lot to do for mollusks. Okay, so mollusks have a uh, major anatomy and I think actually I'd be better off sketching it for you. So let me uh, get you a sketch. Um, let me see if I can... Uh... You know what? I wonder if I can fit this under here because like I think I might be able to hey yeah that, that'll that save us some time won't it okay so um lovely lovely snail so we've got here um the first thing is a mantle which is the sheath of tissue that encloses the vital organs of a mollusk it replaces the mollusk's shell and, and performs respiration and um so it's like this tissue underneath the shell. I, by the way, I'm, I am going to have to draw this just so that you know what to put in your notes. I'm just trying to show you um, a better picture because it's not in the slideshow. So um, we got a mantle, which is its tissue underneath of its shell. Then, of course, a shell and a visceral hump. Um, the visceral hump is this mound of... <laughs> of flesh that's underneath um, the shell. So if you think about where all your organs are, you got all your major organs like inside of your chest, inside of your gut, that's protected with like your rib cage. 
Um, the way that um, a mollusk does this is it puts all of its major organs inside of this big lump called its visceral hump, and then it encloses that in a shell. Okay, so um, let's actually uh, draw this. So I think I'm going to have to draw the shell cutaway, of course. So I'm going to draw, draw the shell. Sure, that's kind of what a snail shell looks like, cross-section. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is a art class with Mr. S. It's not going so great, but we're going to do our best. So, the um, visceral hump is um, this tissue that's here. It's where the heart, digestive, and excretory organs are. And um, the mantle is basically the uh, surface of it. Okay, so if you were to go underneath of the shell, um, first of all, don't do that. That's the snail's personal space. But if you were looking underneath the shell, just kind of like could remove it like you could take off a hat, you'd see the mantle, which is the surface of the visceral hump. The visceral hump is where all those organs are. Let's get to some of those organs, shall we? So um, it's got a foot, which is just hilarious, um, that it's actually called a foot. The foot is the name of this thing on the bottom, <laughs> okay? that it uses to move. I mean, if you're going to move with it, why call it anything other than a foot? It's a muscular organ that's used for locomotion, and depending on what kind of mollusk it is, it could take a variety of forms. For something like a, a snail, it would kind of like, you know, undulate and um, be lubricated with slime. Um, a radula is the organ covered with teeth that mollusks use. Here we go. To... Um, to grind, uh, to, to scrape food into their mouth. So I'm gonna have to draw its head here. I'm using up as many colors as I can so that you can distinguish parts. Let me go ahead with um, green for this. So, okay, that's uh, the cutaway of its mouth. And let me give it some uh, There we go. It's so cute. All right, there's our snail. So if this is its mouth, let me uh, use uh, blue for that. So if this is its mouth, it's got this little, uh, <laughs> got this little thing in there. Um, it's an organ covered with teeth and that's called its radula. Um, Radula totally sounds like um, the cool vampire. Hey, Radula. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about its uh, shell for a second. Um, so there are a lot of mollusks that live in the ocean that we're a bit more familiar with, things like oysters and clams. And what's... Um, interesting about like oysters and clams is their shells are like this, right? Well, those are two different sides of the shell. If you have two shells like that, you're called a bivalve. Bivalve. And if you have one shell like a snail, then you are a univalve. Now, um, under the category of univalve, it's gastropod. And I want to just break down that word for you. Gastro refers to stomach, like gastric acid is like your your stomach juices this is so nice um whenever i talk about gross stuff in physics you should take physics then pod is like foot like podiatrist is a foot doctor so gastropod means stomach foot i mean look it's it's belly is its foot um on the other hand uh bivalve is a pole 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 that other word, I I can't even I can't even. Okay, so um, let's uh let's get more onto um, its 
anatomy. Oh, okay. I think I've actually run out of anatomy. So let me just read this slide and then I'll fill in the picture of the snail. Then we can be done. The snail moves by contracting its foot over a thin layer of slime. The visceral hump is under the shell. Mantle is between visceral shell and uh, visceral hump and shell. Rich in blood vessels. Okay, okay. So just uh, just tying stuff up. So here's how this works. Okay, we've got the digestive tract. I'm going to draw that in blue. The digestive tract of this snail. Okay runs through and the name of the tube that connects your mouth to the rest of your digestive system is called your esophagus but i bet you knew that because you know you have one of those in here um and the uh here we go i'm just trying try to make sure i'm not missing anything so the esophagus leads to intestines and the intestines lead through the body. And you might be thinking, hey, Mr. Estes, it's heading away from the posterior side. When's it gonna end up at the snail's rear end? Well, have I got some news for you. This is the snail's rear end. This is actually where it expels its waste it expels it onto its own back. Um, look, I don't make the rules, um, but if I did, it would probably be that snails should wipe their backs. That is the um, digestive system of the snail. These are the intestines up here. I'd write it, but then it would get really cramped. There's one more system. Um, this is something that the uh, um, planarian didn't have but um, a mollusk does, that would be its circulatory system. And the way that it's circulatory, I'm not sure how I can draw this without um, messing up everything that's already here. But you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best. I think I can use, what color? You wouldn't mind if I use purple again, would you? Cause I got purple on the foot, but I, I just wanna keep everything separate. So yeah, I'm gonna use purple. See how I pretended to ask for your permission. So let's, uh, Let's go ahead, uh, throw some blood vessels on here. Lots of blood vessels in here. Yay, blood vessels. Everybody loves blood vessels. And yeah, blood vessels are very close to my heart. So um, speaking of blood vessels, they end up having something of a little heart <laughs> back here. So uh, they're... <laughs> Yeah, heart. Their circulatory system is very basic. There's one more point I want to make about this, and um, it has some relevance to something I'm going to ask you later. So do you know how our blood is red? The reason that our blood is red is because of a substance called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that um, has an iron atom in it. It's at the center. And something that iron does is it oxidizes. It captures oxygen. And that's actually what makes your blood useful for your circulation. By capturing oxygen, hemoglobin is able to transport oxygen elsewhere. Um, so the reason that makes our blood red is because the oxygenation of iron turns it into what is like essentially rust. You have rusty blood basically when it's oxygenated snails like mollusks do not have hemoglobin instead they have something called hemocyanin and instead of using iron it uses copper do you realize what this means do you know what color copper turns when it becomes oxygenated. Have you ever seen a corroded penny? They're like this blue-green color. That's what color snail blood is. It's not red. It's that like bluish-greenish color that um, comes from oxygenated copper. And it's also um, interesting to note that we transport our hemoglobin through our blood 
with red blood cells. That's not actually how mollusks do it. Their hemocyanin is just freely distributed in their uh, in the uh, like the fluid that's transported through its blood vessels. So they don't even have blood cells like we have. Um, right. So there's 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 uh, a question that you may be thinking. One is, um, are we almost done? And yes, yes, we are. The other question um, that comes to mind, it's a question that um, often comes up in math class. It's why are we learning this? Um, which is which is fair. Um, oh, I just realized there's something I left off here. Sorry about that. Um, I've left off its sensory organs. It has its eyes on stalks. That's supposed to be an exclamation point because I'm pretending to be excited. Uh, those are its eyes up there, and it has these little antenna tentacle things down here uh, that it uses for its senses. Okay, sorry for that interruption. Why are we learning this? Hmm. So when you're studying different kinds of animals, it could just be a trip through the zoo. Oh, look at the pretty this, look at the gross that just you know different kinds of animals i mean and that's fine but that's you know that that's like how kindergartners learn about animals just look at all the different animals that's a that's a very basic way to learn about animals and that's not what this is you guys aren't in kindergarten the point of this is not for you to see all the different kinds of animals just to know here's the point of it um maybe i should have said this at the beginning but you know um when we're looking at life science, we are taking on the idea of life and how organisms work as one big picture. And while it's interesting to look at how humans and snails are different, because of course we're very different, it's even more fascinating to look at how we are the same. The fact that we are both living creatures made of cells containing DNA, performing uh, respiration, having a metabolism, all the criteria for life that make us both alive. And of course, if we're both alive, I mean, we share that with bacteria. But because we are both animals, snails and humans, to understand what makes animals unique, as different as we are from snails, just think about what we both have. We both have a mouth. We both have a through digestive tract that ends in an anus with intestines in the middle. We both use enzymes to break down our food so that we can atomize it and absorb the molecules directly into our bloodstream and then transport those to other cells that need it. We both need oxygen in our metabolism, even though we capture it differently. The point is we have a protein with a metal in the center of it whose purpose is to capture that oxygen. We have um, some way of moving, even though the way in which we move is completely different. There are some of these things we could even say we have in common with plants that have their vascular tissue. Now, plants are rooted and they don't move, but they still have to be able to navigate space. Sometimes they use animals to transport their seeds for them. Sometimes they are able to manipulate the way they grow with auxins. Guys, if all you want to get out of life science is all the pretty animals. Well, then this was sure a disappointment because most of the time we talked about parasitic worms. But if what you're looking for out of science is to understand the world you're in, then this is the way you want to look at it. Um, I highly recommend understanding the world that you're in because you don't 
get to thrive in an environment you don't understand, okay? If you get dropped off in a, a city in another country and you have no idea what the customs are, you have no idea what the language is, you don't know what the manners are, you're going down and you're going down fast. You need to understand your environment in order to thrive in it. And I think that everybody has the goal of thriving in your environment. Well, your environment is Earth. And if you want to do well on the Earth, then you need to know how things on Earth do well so that you can be your best and that you can understand your place on the planet. All right, well, that's uh, it for this section, and I'll see you in the next one.